attitude determination. So last time we talked about sensors that are used for attitude determination, like sun sensors. Right? If you've got, you're on a spacecraft, you got your body fixed frame and you're measuring things like where's the sun with respect to your body fixed frame. And then based on the orbit determination, you should know inertially where's the sun. So with respect to an Earth-centered inertial frame, then that gives you one vector. And we said that you actually need to resolve two. So maybe you get some other vector from the magnetic field or from something else, maybe something pointing at a star. You need at least two. So we talked about the triad method using two because that's what it uses. But you can improve the accuracy of your attitude determination measuring multiple vectors. And that's where we ended last time. So this is continuing along that vein when you have multiple vectors. So this is attitude determination. We're imagining all of these vectors are measured at the same time. You're measuring on board using sensors, some unit vectors. We're going to have several of them. So maybe I'll say K goes from one to N. You are measuring them in the body fixed frame, okay, on board the spacecraft. And then from a model based on the orbit location, where you are in your orbit, you have an idea of what that same vector should be measured in an inertial frame, end frame. What you want is the orientation or attitude that relates the two frames. Before we've called that the C matrix because of direction cosine, but using the explicit frame labeling notation, we would use, uh, we'll use B and N. So we want to measure that. And the way that these vectors are related to each other through. So the vectors are related through that. Of course, there's always going to be some kind of error. So the error will probably be in the onboard measurement. I mean, but it, it could be in the model. Like if, once you get into the details, if you work for Weber, Blue Origin, Boeing, you'll find out the details, but there'll be, there's always errors in measurement. And we said a little bit about that last time, that the star trackers are the most accurate. They can be down to like one millionth of a degree accuracy. Sun is like one hundredth of a degree accuracy. And then things like the magnetic field are pretty bad, like one degree or five degrees. But if you take multiple measurements of multiple things, so if that means if n, little n here, is very large, then you should get a more accurate estimate. So how do you do that? Each set of vectors is going to give you something slightly different here. So with the goal of finding a good rotation matrix, we want to minimize something called a loss function, or we'll call it a cost function. Our goal is to use a statistical method to get the best estimate of our three by three orientation matrix using all available information. That means you know all n vectors. Of course, they'll all give something slightly different. So another way to put this goal of getting the best estimate, there are different ways of putting it, but one way of putting it is to minimize the least squares error across all of the measurements. We write a loss function, or it's sometimes called a cost function, j. It's a function of this, we'll be estimating, that's why we put a bar over the b. b bar means it's the estimated body frame. We'll never have access to the true body frame. We'll always have some estimated body frame. So that's what we're trying to get at. And this cost function, we want the cost function to be zero if all measurements were perfect. The way that we will write this is it's one half and then the sum over the measurements. K goes from one to little n. WK is a weighting. And then we're just going to rewrite this equation up here as something equals zero. We'll write it this way. The kth unit vector that we're measuring in the body fixed frame minus B N N V K, right? That would be zero if everything's perfect. And then we'll square that. So these W Ks are the weights. So you might say, you know, I, I'm gonna put a lot of weight on the measurements for things that I believe a priori are very accurate like the sun sensor or a star tracker. And then maybe I'll weight less things like the magnetometer reading. And so then there'd be a whole you know, method to try to figure out what are the best weights. We won't worry about that 
necessarily right now. We want to minimize this. So we want the three by three rotation matrix that minimizes J. So note uh, J equals zero. That's the minimum you could get, right? Because this over here, the weights are all uh, greater than or equal to zero. And this thing squared is also going to be something greater than or equal to zero. The lowest that you could go is J equals zero if all measurements were perfect. Perfect means no error, zero error. But that's not going to happen. What this will do is it's a lot like if you've done curve fitting. This is a matrix version of curve fitting. With curve fitting, you've typically got some data points and you're trying to estimate a curve that matches everything. If you go into it saying there is some curve, I believe there is a curve that is the best estimate, then you'll come up with some curve where what's being minimized is this distance of the the data points to the line. It's actually the distance squared. The points are data points. The red line, this is the distance to the estimate. And you know, like the blue line is your estimate. In some sense, the blue line is like the matrix that we're trying to figure out. A three by three matrix actually has nine numbers, right? So we're trying to figure out what are those nine numbers given these measurements. So we're going to do it in a, this squaring means a least squares. We're doing something that's a least squares estimate. And you'll find this all the time in estimation. Least squares is sort of the first thing that you would do. So that's what we're trying to do. Let me say some more about this. We could represent BN as nine independent numbers right? Because it is a three by three matrix. So it has nine entries. However, we know because it's a rotation matrix, these nine entries aren't all independent. There is a constraint. And the constraint on a rotation matrix is that the transpose of that matrix times the matrix would be the three by three identity. So the nine entries are not all independent. There are better ways to do it. Right, we've seen some ways that you could parameterize or represent a rotation matrix. We've got other ways to represent B and N, and that would be with Euler angles. That's one that we've talked about. Principal, axis, and angle. And then the last one that we talked about were the Euler parameters, which are the entries of a quaternion. The Euler angles have that notorious problem where they have a singularity. So there are some orientations that are not uniquely defined by the Euler angles. So we might throw that one out. Principal axis and angle also had a problem. If you have zero rotation, which means an angle of zero, you could have any axis. So it had problems. The only one that didn't have problems is Euler parameters. So we might wanna use Euler parameters. Remember those were the betas. There's a mapping right between the betas and your matrix, the rotation matrix, and it's given in equation 3.98. Before we get to that, let's look back at this cost function because the cost function can be written in an actually pretty nice way. And then maybe we'll return to writing the cost function in, in terms of Euler parameters. But back to the cost function. The cost function that we're trying to minimize using all info is this j equals one half sum of k goes from one to little n, the weights, that's a w. And then I'll write that squared thing in terms of a, a matrix form, b measured in the b frame minus b n, this is estimated, n v k transpose b v k minus b n n v k. I'm writing it this way, but this is the same as the magnitude of that vector squared. I'm, just, I'm writing it in this way because now I'm going to work from this and write it all out because it ends up looking kind of nice. K from one to N, W, K. All right, what is the transpose? If I take the transpose, I get V, B, K transpose minus V, N, K transpose, B, N, transpose, right? That's what happens when you take the transpose. The transpose of, if you have something multiplied by something else, you reverse the order. And now that's times this, B, N, N, V, K. And now I'll carry through the multiplication. So this is 
It doesn't change the weights at all. But if I carry this through, I'll get this unit vector transpose times that same unit vector. That's interesting. Plus this unit vector transpose bn transpose bn vn k minus, and then I'll have two of something, two v k in the body fixed frame transpose b n uh, v k n. What do I know here? I'm assuming that this is a rotation matrix. So any rotation matrix transpose times itself gives us the identity. So it's a three by three identity plus all of these are unit vectors. So this is the same as the magnitude of that unit vector squared, but it's unit vector, so it's equal to one. And the same thing we'll be left with here is the unit vector of the same thing uh, squared equals one. So I'll get, let me just write it out. And then this will explain why there was a one half in front. Like what's up with the one half? I get two minus, to this weird thing, v hat k in the b frame, b n n v k. So then the twos, I bring the twos out and these each become one. I don't have a one half in front, one minus that. Now looking at, remember this is j, there's a minus sign here. So minimizing j corresponds to maximizing uh, the sum of this. I mean, let me carry through. What do I get? I get sum k equals one through n of w k minus sum k goes from one to n w k. All these weights are positive, so this is just something greater than or equal to zero. If I want to minimize j, it means I want to maximize this thing. To minimize j, maximize this. And that's important enough that I'll just give it a name. I'll call it the function g. So we want to maximize, now let's define this as function g of this matrix. So we use there that we're, we've got unit vectors and the properties of a rotation matrix. And then so we're left with this, which is easier to deal with. Okay. So we want to maximize that. It doesn't look very pretty, but if we write it in terms of the Euler parameters, it ends up simplifying after a little bit of algebra and looking particularly nice. I'll just say, recall, and this is equation 3.98. And here I'll write it this way. So this is writing the rotation matrix in terms of betas. And maybe we'll say, because we're talking about the estimated beta uh, or estimated B frame, we'll write bars over these. So this means these are estimated parameters. We can rewrite G in terms of the estimated beta vector. Put bars over them. This is um, it's a column vector. So after some algebra, we'll see that this G, which we originally wrote, and is, it's a function of the rotation matrix, well, that's equivalent to G as a function of this beta vector beta bar vector, and it looks particularly nice. It looks like beta, the vector bar transpose times a four by four matrix K times beta, the vector as a column vector, where K is a four by four matrix. And let me give you what K is. It's, it's in the book. I'll put it here as well. Sigma, Z, transpose, that's a capital Z, capital Z, S minus Sigma, and then the three by three identity. This is equation 3.228. And so all of these have some meaning. It's all based on a B matrix. And again, B matrix seems to be, we keep using B for all these different matrices. This is a different B matrix. So please bear that in mind. So this thing that's called the B matrix is, it's a sum uh, from, K goes from one to N. It's the weights, WK times 
the measurement of um, the unit vector, the kth measurement in the body fix frame times that same unit vector in the inertial frame transpose. So this is a three by three matrix and it gets used in writing out what all of these things are. Sigma is the trace of B. S is B plus B transpose. And Z, it's a vector that's made up of different entries of B. So it's B, 2, 3, minus B, 3, 2. B, 3, 1, minus B, 1, 3. And then B, 1, 2, minus B, 2, 1. So it's a... It's a column vector. So if you do all of these things, and like the first row will be this up here. That's why we write Z transpose. And then the bottom block will be given by the stuff below. We're going to go through a numerical example. So we're going to eventually construct this K matrix using the same example kind of sun and magnetic field vectors that we used for the last lecture, where we used the triad method. And now we'll use a different method. Writing the G function. It's a scalar function. It's written in terms of the Euler parameters. And writing it this way, this is part of what's called Davenport's Q method. Davenport, and I think, worked for NASA long ago. It's called the Q method because it's based on quaternions. The entries of the quaternion are the Euler parameters. So you could just as easily call it Davenport's Euler parameter method. It's, it's called in the literature... Um, and among practitioners, the Davenport's Q method. That's what we're going through right now. This is, if you wanted to be following along, I think it's in section uh, 3103 of Shaman Junkins. Okay, we still haven't figured out how to use this yet. We've rewritten this function. We're trying to get the best beta bar, so the best four entries that will maximize G. And so this becomes an optimization problem. And I don't know if you've taken optimization courses, but in general, if you wanted to optimize a scalar function, suppose we have f as a function of x, and by optimize, maybe you're looking for the max, then if we were to plot f of x, the thing that you would do would be to look for where the derivative equals zero, and then maybe you'd check another criteria, like is this the maximum? So is this concave down? So to find out where is f of x maximum, the criterion would be look for the derivative of f with respect to x, set it equal to zero. And right, you'd have this point and this point, and then you would look for a second derivative of f with respect to x less than zero, which means this is concave down. And you go, aha, that's my maximum. When it's in one dimension, we can visualize it, but we're trying to optimize something over this four-dimensional vector space. We're trying to find the maximum of, it is still a scalar function, but it's over this beta bar vector, where beta bar is four-dimensional. It's also not the case that all of the beta entries are independent. So that's an important consideration. There's a constraint. We have an optimization problem subject to a constraint. So remember, beta, this the magnitude of this, for this to be a, a representation of a three by three rotation matrix has to equal one. Another way to write that instead of writing it that way would be writing it as the vector transpose times itself. And that'll still give us the same thing. So we have a constraint on the betas. They're not all independent. It's hard enough to do an optimization problem when there's no constraints, but now we have an optimization problem with a constraint. So it gets a little bit weirder. So the way that we would write this is we would say maximize G, which is a function of this beta bar vector, which is equal to beta bar transpose K beta bar vector subject to beta bar transpose beta minus one equals zero. So it's a constrained optimization problem. And when you have a constrained optimization problem, you introduce Lagrange multipliers. And I'm not gonna go into the details of, this is not an optimization class. If you've seen it, great. If not, 
and just trust me. We introduce a Lagrange multiplier, lambda. It's one number, it's an unknown scalar that will in some sense enforce the constraint. And then we create a new function G, maybe we'll call it G1. It's sometimes called an augmented function. So I'll call this G1. It'll still be a function of beta bar. And it will be, we'll first write the thing that we're trying to maximize. And then we subtract lambda and then the constraint. So the constraint is something of, of the form, uh, a function of the thing you're trying to optimize equals zero. So that's why I'm just sort of plugging in this. So we could write it that way. It doesn't quite matter if you do plus or minus lambda. I'm just doing it this way. And then just like up above in this scalar example, remember I said, right, if, if we wanted to maximize, we'd take the derivative of f, set it, uh, derivative of f with respect to x, set it equal to zero. We could do the same thing here, but we're just taking the derivative of this augmented function, g1, with respect to beta. So once we've created this augmented function to get the max partial g1 partial beta bar and set it equal to zero. And that'll give us a necessary condition on what the beta bar needs to be. If we actually take that, maybe you're not familiar with taking derivatives of things that have weird vectors like this, but you can check this later with simpler cases. This is going to end up being k times beta, the vector. Actually, it's two minus two lambda beta bar. You set this equal to zero. That's the condition for an extremum. We won't yet know if it's a maximum or minimum. So it is a necessary condition for a maximum, right? You set that equal to zero, you can cancel out the twos and you'll get K times beta bar equals lambda times beta. Then you go, oh, okay. This looks like an eigenvector eigenvalue equation. And it is, and that's particularly elegant and nice. This is what Devonport found. This is a necessary condition to actually get a maximum. That means we need to maximize what the eigenvalue is. The Euler parameter that maximizes G will be an eigenvector of K. And not just any eigenvector, it will be the eigenvector corresponding to the maximum eigenvalue. Maybe we'd call that lambda max of k. So this lends itself to solving on a computer. If you put this back, let's call that corresponding eigenvalue beta max. Put it into g, the original g. g beta max equals beta max transpose k beta max, but then because we've chosen an eigenvalue, this will be lambda max times beta max. So we'll have, we can pull out the overall lambda max and then beta max transpose times beta max. This equals one. So we're just left with lambda max. So that's the largest value that we could get. It's a pretty elegant solution. You've got this K matrix if you remember, it was constructed by our observations. The K matrix involved, all these entries had something to do with this thing that they call the B matrix, which had the weights and then the, the vectors that we've measured in the body fixed frame and that we've estimated from our model in the inertial frame. And then you take various, you do various things with that. You've got this S, you've got the trace, you've got this Z thing. Um, so you construct this four by four matrix from all of your observations, right? You do this sum, and then you just get the eigenvector corresponding to the maximum eigenvalue. And that is the beta that gives you the best estimate of the rotation matrix. So from this maximum eigenvalue, you construct Bn, which is our best estimate of the attitude or orientation or rotation matrix. If you go more into this area, you'll learn about like Kalman filters and other ways of estimating things. This is just a quick run through of this particular method. This is Devonport's Q method. And let me 
summarize it and then we'll do an example. Okay, summary to use the Q method, we must first compute that four by four K matrix. Then we find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the K matrix. Then we pick the largest eigenvalue and the associated eigenvector. Professor? Yeah. When we're picking the largest eigenvalue, is that like just the largest or like the mo highest absolute value? It'll be largest. Gotcha. Yeah. Because yeah, if it had the largest absolute value, it could be a negative absolute value, which means, or like a, ne a negative value, which means we're not maximizing G. So we really do need this to be like positive. So it'll be largest and positive. So we pick the largest eigenvalue, lambda max, and the associated eigenvector, which I call beta max. Then what? This eigenvector is the correct Euler parameter vector for the rotation. Correct, meaning best estimate of the Euler parameter giving the orientation. I'm going to do a MATLAB demo. Welcome to MATLAB. When you do a percent, and it, it just means comment. So this is example 316 of the book, just using Davenport's Q method. And so we'll use the same yaw pitch and roll as I did for the previous example, which I don't expect you to remember, but it was, it's 30, 20, and negative 10. And we always write in radians. So that's our yaw pitch and roll which means what's our true BN? Is the BN true? I'm using this command that's part of that MATLAB zip file provided basically with the book on a website. So this just does the conversion for me. Otherwise I'd be writing out a bunch of sines and cosines. No. Okay, where am I? Did something wrong. Uh, oh, oh, I'm in the wrong thing. Yeah, these live demos are always a pain. But you get to see how I, uh, how I recover. There we go. Okay. So now I think it'll work. Because I have the command in this folder. There we go. So this is the true, the true one. This is what I'm trying to find out, get. So what did we do last time? We said that uh, the sun vector in the inertial frame was exactly, I guess, in the kind of x direction, so there. And then the the magnetic field vector is exactly in the z direction. But then we messed these up some, and I'm just going to copy and paste how I messed with it last time to introduce a little bit of error. And now I'll say that the way that the method works is you give it some. We were using the notation of v sub k, unit vectors. So I'll say v1 n is s n v2 n is m n the magnetic field so that's I'm, I'm assuming those are known so those are actually being written without error there might be a little bit of error because of orbit determination and where we are but let's just for sake of argument assume there's no error and then we've already introduced some error these are a little bit off uh like by a degree or two from what they would actually be Say so that's the first vector, but measured in our body fixed frame. And then V2B is this slightly erroneous magnetic field vector. For sake of argument, if, if I don't know which one to weight more, then I would weight them equally. So right for now, for this example, I will weight them equally. So I'll say W1 equals one and W2 equals one. In practice, you would wanna weight things that you think are more accurate with higher weights. We're not going to do that right now. So now what? Now we need to we need to construct that K matrix. And to construct the K matrix, we first need to write that B matrix. I remember what it was. It was the sum of W1 times V1B times V1N transpose. It's the sum over all of the vectors we have. In this case, we're just saying we have two. So that was 
that's the first one, plus W2 times V2D times V2N transpose. And that will be a three by three matrix that probably won't make much sense to me. And now I could do uh, what's sigma. Sigma was trace of B. So this is just a MATLAB command, trace, cool. S, we defined an S matrix, which is B plus B transpose, which again is probably not gonna make a whole lot of sense to us. Like, I don't know if that's right. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any interesting properties to B to even check. It is what it is. And now uh, Z, this one's not a piece of cake. Z B is B23 minus B3, B, capital B32. And then we're making a column vector here. So I can do that. And then I like to, this is good programming practice. You put things that kind of look similar right beneath. It makes it easy to see if you've made errors. And if you see errors, let me know. But I think this will work. And this also will not make a whole lot of sense, but there it is. So now we've got, I think everything we need to populate the K matrix. So now we assemble all of this and put this into a K matrix. K equals sigma, and then I just do a space, right? Z's already been defined as a column vector. So Z transpose is a row. And then, so that's like the first row. And then I think MATLAB is smart enough that if I do now Z and then the next thing is S minus sigma times, the way you write the three by three identity matrix, it's really weird. You type the word I and then three and that'll do it. And so we'll get this matrix again that we will not, we won't know what to do with this, but there it is. That's the K matrix. I think there are algorithms, they just look for the maximum eigenvalue. We'll just use, you know, the full power of MATLAB. If you haven't used the eigs command, type eigs of K, it lists the eigenval as a diagonal matrix. These are the eigenvalues. And I don't know if this is always going to be the case that are, they're always plus or minus something, but there it is. And if I look at this, I could already tell, oh, 1.997, that's the maximum. And unfortunately, there's no easy way to make MATLAB spit out the eigenvalues in the order of maximum to minimum, at least that I know. So that's our eigenvalue. And so that means the corresponding eigenvector that we care about is this second column up here. So I'll say beta max is eigenvec. This is how you extract the second column. And there it is. Just as a check, let's see if the norm of this thing is equal to one. Good, that's nice. So that means this is it. There's a mapping between beta and the BN matrix. So we could even extract that. We'll call it, let's call it bar B N. So it's is estimated. In fact, this is the estimated beta max. And I've already got, uh, it's one of the functions that's in that library, EP for Euler parameter to C direction cosine matrix, beta max. And I guess we could look at it and go, oh, look at that. How does it compare with the true one? Uh, looks okay. A good way to just get one number out of this, and we did this last time too. We said that, you know, what's the, we'll get the rotation between the estimated frame, which we called bar B, and the true one B, and that's given by bar BN times BN transpose. It's something that if, if it was perfect, it would just be ones along the diagonal. This would be the identity matrix, but it's not perfect. So we write error V and we'll do it in terms of degrees. And now we're getting the angle in the kind of axis angle way of writing things. So it's trace bar BB minus one. Uh, nope, Tr trace and minus one. Got to get my parentheses all in a row. Now to get this in terms of degrees. Oh, I didn't put it times. There we go. Okay. Okay. I get an error that's lower. Last time we got like 1.8 or 1.9 degrees. This time we got 1.6 degrees. So there you go. And theoretically, this should be the lowest possible error given those weights. And so if I weighted one more than the other, I would get some slightly different error. But right now I'm saying there's equal error. 
And so I don't know which one's the better estimate. Guess that's that. That's the Q method. The triad is an easy one to explain, but the Q method would be a more likely method because you would have multiple vectors. If you're on the, the satellite, here's this, look at this satellite. And then here's the earth and here's the sun. You've got a whole bunch of vectors that you could use or the magnetic field. Maybe you've got something looking at the horizon. You've got a horizon detector. Uh, maybe you've got something pointing at a star. So you would have, you know, multiple vectors. And so what's the best way to estimate what your orientation is for your frame, given that you've got these multiple measurements, you would use something like that optimization and um, you'd get the best thing. And maybe you'd have some systematic way for getting different weights. So that's sort of all we're going to say about attitude determination. You know, the next time that we talk about a meaty subject, we're going to get into the rigid body dynamics and issues of stability. And that's sort of going to take us to the end of the course. So if you have questions about this material, you can use the next few minutes. And All right. If, if there's nothing else, I will show a little video of the 313 rotation because it's fun. So this is the 313, right? First a rotation about the number three, and then rotation about the number one axis it's the red one and now the number three axis in, in a new direction so you could do another final rotation about that so 313 is also kind of common can i uh, ask a quick question yeah rotation matrices for like something about the third axis second axis and first axis no matter if we're doing three two one whatever we're we still using the same matrices like we already have the matrices we just need to move them around basically is that true <laughs> You mean like those fundamental yeah. like rotation? Yeah. Okay. It's I just, just a matter sure of cause... doing the matrix multiplication in a different order. Okay. So, I just want to make sure because I thought that's what was going on. And Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm going to need to sign off. So.